CNN is reporting that the Hamas leader that we took out, or I'm sorry, that Israel took out, he was one of the key negotiators for peace. How dare Israel take out the key Hamas leader who was negotiating for peace? And, and you know, when I, I read that, I think if you're part of Hamas in any way, shape, or form, then they deserve to die. That is the bottom line. But it's been a it's been a very uh, compelling twelve hours for Israel. Again, taking out the one of the leaders for Hamas and uh, one of the leaders for Hezbollah as well. Uh, Israel killed their political chief, Ismail Hanaya. And we're going to get more from James Carafano, a uh, foreign policy analyst with the Heritage Foundation and our guest. And James, I know this was a last minute thing. So thank you for uh, joining us. And I've been telling folks about uh, the big news as uh, Israel did take out uh, leaders in both Hamas and Hezbollah in the last uh, 12 hours or so. I-, I find it interesting, James, I was just talking about how CNN is reporting that uh, Hamas, this uh, they're calling him the political chief, uh, Ismail Hanaya, probably not saying his name correctly, but Hamas and CNN are describing him as a moderate within their movement and had become vital in sustained diplomatic efforts to secure a ceasefire. It's almost like they're trying to, I don't know, make this guy seem like he was uh, one of the less radical folks in Hamas, but I just, it's hard for me to believe there is anyone, anyone in Hamas that is not radical. Well, first of all, they just turned down a ceasefire. Um, and, and we've seen this shtick before. We constantly get told that the, the Iranian moderates who are trying to moderate stuff, and there are no Iranian moderates in, in, the, in the Iranian regime. So I, I don't know where CNN gets these talking points from, but, you know, we've increasingly seen this in the media. And, and quite honestly, from our own administration, where, where people are trying to soft pedal Islamist radical terrorist groups and regimes uh, and, and somehow normalize them and make them sound more reasonable. And it, it, it literally is just gaslighting. And, and I understand, the, I, and you know, I'm not a political, I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat. Right. You know, I understand the, the problem of the Democratic Party that literally they have a radical pro-Islamist wing in their party, and they want to try to placate that. Um, and, and what they try to do is kind of soft sell this, this notion that these people just aren't evil. And, and they are. And I don't think it's sustainable for them, and I don't think it's sustainable for American media to try to gaslight the American people on these issues. Well, they, they keep doing it. I mean, don't get me started on the gaslighting, good Lord. But uh, let's stick to Israel and Hamas and, and Hezbollah. A couple of other things is that this was Israel, as far as Hezbollah goes, Hezbollah just in the last uh, week or so, they killed, I think it was 12 uh, kids on a soccer field. And so this is this is Israel. I, I, I just I don't know. Is this Israel saying, you know what, enough is enough? So I think there's two um, observations we can make about this. One is um, Israel's operation in Gaza. It from a, a larger military operational perspective is largely wrapped up. And what this does is it, it it's a signal that the Israelis are saying, look, we are ready to pivot north. Um, and the other thing I think it, that is true is the Israelis had an option here because the Hezbollah has been kind of broadly um uh, threatening the northern border the israelis could have unleashed you know a lot more and and instead what they went for was for a very proportional uh targeted attack on leadership and so they're also sending a signal like dude we don't have to have world war three here you know we all know that hezbollah has 10 times the military capability that hamas ever did Mm -hmm. and they can do a lot of damage in israel but the israelis aren't fighting a two-front war anymore which means that they can unleash all their fury on Hezbollah, I mean, if Hezbollah is going to attack Israel, the time to do that was at the height of the, the Hamas, uh, Gaza operations, and they didn't do that. So I'm not sure that we are facing a broadly swirling, escalating conflict here yet. Big news as uh, Israel has taken out leaders in both Hamas and Hezbollah in the last 12 hours. Now, James, uh, as you know, Hezbollah is now threatening to strike Israel in Tel Aviv. Uh, They say these kind of things all the time. Do they really mean it this time? What do you think the response will be? 
Well, I, I don't know. Uh, look, because at some point, um, you don't know when you're going to trigger an all-out response from Israel, which is going to do enormous da damage to Hezbollah and, and Lebanon, which is a very, very far, fragile country. And, of course, you know, both Hamas and Hezbollah in some ways are, on the one hand, the leadership themselves, you, you know, we see, well, they, they killed a guy that that's in another country. Well, what's the deal? Because they... They, these guys leave the country, and they go other places, and it's the people that get hammered. So they don't pay a price for that. And all their money is squand, you know, sequestered abroad, and, and they don't have to worry about their personal wealth either. But the other thing is they, they largely are capable because of the money and the pressure they get from the Iranians. And the reality is, is the Iranians are willing to fight you know, to the last Palestinian or to the last person in Lebanon. So... The, you know, the question for them is: Is do they do they pull the trigger that their masters say and kind of go into the buzzsaw fighting the Israelis or not? And and that's difficult because they really don't want to do that because there's there's no way they come there's no way their people come out better of this and there's no way their organization comes out better for this. But on the other hand, the leaders will likely be fine. They can't kill them all, and they've got all their money, and the Iranians will just rebuild that. So. The reality is this all goes back to Iran, which is the chief instigator and troublemaker in the region. And again, not political, but the reality is over the last four years, we've allowed so much, we pumped so much money into Iran that we have made them this dangerous. And the, this is a strategy that was tried under Obama for eight years and it completely failed. Mm -hmm. This idea of engagement and alignment, which is we, we engage our enemies and then we, you know, we ply them with money and relief from sanctions, and we try to align our interests so they won't attack us. But what they do is they see that as weakness, and they turn around and they stab us in the face. And until we reverse our policies and seriously deal with the Iranian regime, we're going to have this conversation every week. Are we, you know, are we ready for the next war between Israel and whoever? Because the Iranians will throw somebody else under the bus to do well, this. Well, and I in, – in you know, you saw what happened, obviously, in Venezuela, where same thing happened in the sense that Biden loosened the sanctions that Trump uh, placed on them and they promised free and fair elections. And look what happened. And now Venezuela is in is in even more turmoil. But let's stick with Israel um, real quick. Uh, Kamala Harris has said that on the one hand, she supports Israel. On the other hand, she is concerned about what's going on in Gaza. But in her statements, she didn't mention anything about Iran or the fact that if she were elected president, Lord help us, I will say, uh, would she place those sanctions back on Iran? I think you and I both know the answer to that question. That is no. And, and I think that right. she does have to uh, say she does have to have a stronger uh, opinion and policy on Iran. I just don't think that's going to happen. Well, look, her statements are completely fatuous, right? You know, she she said, well, I care about dead children. So 10, you know, children were murdered by Hezbollah. She said nothing. Yeah. And actually, the, the, and what she did was, uh, again, it's not a political statement. It's just a reality. She gave aid and comfort to the enemy. The day after she made her statement, Hamas turned down a ceasefire deal. Mm -hmm. And then the day after that, Hezbollah murdered a bunch of children. So it's the, it is the same, exact same line as Biden is you, you give this space to your enemies because you think you're going to be able to work with them, and all they do is they get more aggressive and and, um, and destructive. And, and you know, Venezuela, she helped. She was one of the architects of the Venezuela policy. We mm -hmm. empowered the Venezuelans, and what did they do? Literally, the guy tried to steal an election where, where he only got like 20, 30 percent of the vote. It's, it's not – I mean – you know, people can vote however they want, and I'm not political, but the reality is if you think you're going to get a different foreign policy from Harris than you got from Biden, you're wrong. She just came out yesterday and said the first thing she's going to do is put Joe Biden's border security bill, you know, and get it passed. Well, we all know that that border security bill was actually a Trojan horse. There was actually no border security in the bill. Yep. It just enabled more illegal immigration, and it regularized it, and she's already endorsed mass amnesty for – illegal immigrants, which will only increase this. So if anybody thinks that you're going to get a different domestic or foreign policy 
then there's there's absolutely zero evidence of that. James Carafano, I know this was extremely last minute. Thank you so much for joining us here on Nashville's Morning News Super Talk 99.7 WTN.